I love you always, forever, near and far, closer together. I'm singing the elephant love medley with an elephant. Hey, it's good. It's good. I'm going to put you back over here. Oh my god, hey! Welcome back to my Stagey YouTube channel. If you are meeting me for the first time, hello! My name is Mickey Joe, and I am obsessed with all things theatre. And this is my YouTube channel, where I review the shows that I have been invited to go and see as an independent freelance theatre critic here in the UK. I also make a lot of other content about all things theatre worldwide, whether that's news, drama, gossip, anything that you might imagine. If that sounds like the kind of thing that you would like to see more of on YouTube, make sure you subscribe to my channel. So today I'm going to be talking to you all about Moulin Rouge, the West End production of Moulin Rouge, currently playing at the Piccadilly Theatre. It has been here in the West End for just over a year, and almost exactly a year ago, I published my first video review of the production when I was invited to the press night. Tonight, they had a gala performance to celebrate the show's replacement principal cast members, its second West End cast. Here is the programme, and also I'm going to have to stand up because I worked too hard on this outfit for you to only see a small portion of it. Excuse me. The shoes were really nice too. You're just going to have to believe me about that one because I've already taken them off. Look at this shirt. Look at this detail with a leather trouser as well. It had to be done. Why? Because I can, can, can. So today, I'm going to be talking to you all about the new cast members at Moulin Rouge, led by Jamie Moscato and Melissa James, because my previous complaint about the show was, though I liked the visuals and the aesthetic and the production value and the campness of all of it, I thought it's too principal performers, Lisi Lafontaine and Jamie Boggio, I thought that they were miscast in their roles. They lacked chemistry and I didn't enjoy either of their performances as much as I had hoped that I would. So the question of today's video, is the show better for these two replacement principal performers? Today, we will find out. Before I get started on this review, if you would like to read all of my written reviews about various London-based theatre productions, you can click on the link in the description down below and sign up to an account with ShowScore. It's absolutely free, and as well as automatically following all of my reviews which are posted on there, you will also be able to review and score productions that you've seen in London or in New York for yourself. Also, if you have been enjoying my content and would like to see some exclusive additional content, you can sign up to become one of my YouTube members. That link is also somewhere in the description. Now, let's talk about Moulin Rouge. So primarily I am here to talk about the new cast, but I will just recap my feelings about this show because every time that I've seen it, I feel like I've enjoyed it a little bit more. I had seen this production twice before. The second time I saw it, I was sat in can, -can seats right at the front, and that was a really special evening at the theatre. I think because it's just such an overwhelming experience to be that close to such a lavish show. I do think that Moulin Rouge, from its facade, from its marquee, from the merchandise on offer, from the design throughout the auditorium, from the set design, from all of the subsequent sets that come on, from the preset, all of it, from the costuming and the choreography and the spectacle and the, the confetti and the pyrotechnics, I think its commitment to lavish theatricality and showmanship is peerless and there is nothing else in the West End right now that can compare with it. I thought there are three things that Moulin Rouge does the best in London and possibly worldwide, which is that it has the best marquee on the front of its theatre, it has the best auditorium, and it has the best set design. And also, a fourth one, I think it has the best Act 2 opening number in all of uh, West End right now, and possibly worldwide right now, because that Act 2 opening, as well as the first 10 minutes of the first act, so high octane, so fantastically choreographed and brilliantly performed, it's gives you so much energy and enthusiasm. It's just what so many people want when they book tickets to see a West End musical. This is what they are expecting and it delivers on that front very, very well. All of this being said, there is still this slight shallowness to it. And I think much of that is because of the nature of the material, because it is inherently jukebox, because that is how the Baz Luhrmann film was put together. Baz Luhrmann's film had this slightly campy but 
epic romance vibe. It reminds me of Jekyll and Hyde in a lot of ways to give you a musical theatre angle into all of this. Uh, but I do think, obviously, there were certain consistencies it had to have with the film version to adapt itself for stage. And it was always going to be a certain amount of camp and it was always going to be jukebox. Possibly it oversteps the line of a little bit of silliness with the way that it includes certain songs, things like the Rick Astley never going to give you up moment um, and possibly Chandelier I know is not everyone's favourite. But for the most part, I think it strikes a decent campy balance. But while it takes itself completely seriously, it's not necessarily the most meaningful and profound love story. It is still inherently a campy show. But if that's what you are expecting and that's what you want from Moulin Rouge, then you're going to have a fantastic time. And once you come to terms with that being what it is, then uh, it's very easy to enjoy. I think last year I gave this either a three or a four star review. I don't know if I was controversial enough to give it a three, but at the time I did think it had three star principles with five star spectacle. So perhaps that was a four star. And I would now say that the principal cast are stronger and it's still a four star review from me. Or if it was a three last time, it is now a four star review from me. It's not a perfect show, but certainly I enjoyed it more this time around. So let me tell you about these new performers and why they do make the show more enjoyable. So from one Jamie to another, Christian is now played by Jamie Moscato. Fans of Heathers will of course remember Jamie Moscato as London's original JD in Heathers. He played the role at the Other Palace Theatre, reprised it at the Theatre Royal Haymarket for the show's West End run. He has also been in UK productions of Big Fish and Dogfight and was recently seen as Enjolras in the staged concert version of Les Miserables. He is a fantastic rock tenor vocalist and an enormous talent. He is a remarkable performer, and I think a lot of people were expecting him to be the West End's original Christian when the production first opened. No one was anticipating Jamie Boggio, who was then pretty much a graduate um, snatching this very coveted role from all of the West End's leading tenors. But in any case, Jamie Moscato is now playing the role, and if nothing else, vocally, he is sublime. He is far and away giving you the strongest vocal that I have heard in this role. I heard Jamie Boggio sing the role, I heard uh, the previous walking cover Christian, Adam Gillian, singing the role, um, and Jamie Moscato, his voice is very comfortable with this material because he has this rock tenor style and he has this contemporary edge while giving you the musical theatre levels of belting and drama. Uh, so it's a really great fit for him. He gives you that Aaron Tveit vocal vibe, which is what everyone needs from this show. And his acting's really great as well. He does a lovely swoon. He believably falls in love. His moments where he talks to the audience or sort of winks to the audience, which happens quite a lot throughout the first act, those are done very well. I know that he is not particularly a dancer, so the way that he does throw himself into some of the few choreographic moments that he has, I thought was very impressive. He's just very game throughout the whole thing. And he does a lovely job. I think he is the strongest Christian that I have seen in this production. And so many of the big numbers land so much better for him being able to deliver a strong vocal. I hadn't yet seen a version of Roxanne or Your Song, perhaps, that landed quite as well as it did tonight because of the vocal delivery. If you know anything about Jamie Moscato, you also know that he loves to interpolate a growl into his vocals. And I was waiting for when we were gonna get that growl. And obviously Roxanne and then Crazy Rolling were the numbers where he started growling. Bless the casting directors who are continuing to cast Jamie Moscato in emotionally and romantically anguished roles because I need his growl in my life. The one he did in Freeze Your Brain and Dead Girl Walking in Heathers. It is so good, and it's perfectly placed in Moulin Rouge as well. Another of my favorite notes about his performance is the way that he reacts to things. His reaction to Satine collapsing in his arms is heartbreaking and spot on. His, oh gosh, the scene where he comes out and he steps back into the performance right before that had happened and he's brought the actual gun with him and you don't know what he's going to do. The amount of time that they take there 
and the pause and his frenzied desperation is all absolutely brilliant. He does this thing where he first steps onto the stage and he sort of recoils at the brightness of the lights. I'm not sure whether he's playing someone who's not used to being on a stage because that's the first performance rather than a rehearsal, or whether he's playing hungover because the last time we saw him, he was drinking an apocalyptic amount of absinthe. So fascinated by the notes he's putting into his performance there. And again, I think he does a really good job at crafting this character. And had the show opened with him in this role, would he have gotten an Olivier Award nomination? I think certainly he may have been more likely to. So opposite him is Melissa James as Satine. And you can tell when watching anyone performing as Satine what a challenging role it is. The costuming is corseted. She's in these heeled boots throughout. She has a dozen costume changes. Some of them happen on stage. People are lifting her up and tearing clothes off of her and zipping her into new things and putting things over her and throwing her around the stage. And she's descending from the ceiling on a swing and she has to unbuckle herself while she's still halfway down a few feet above the air in a different corset. And like, she had to change her tights at one point because she had a rip in her fishnets and then she came back on in different fishnets. And so I'm like, she has a tights costume tip? Like that just seems like a ball ache. It's just a lot that she has to do. She has to front these production numbers while playing like perfection because she's the sparkling diamond. She has to make everyone fall in love with her. She has to be completely charismatic, huge vocals, amazing dancer. And then she has to play this layer underneath that at the same time where you can tell that something is not quite right and that she has this developing illness. So it's a huge ask, it's an enormous ask. I originally saw Lucy LaFontaine in this role and I was expecting really big things from her after her performance as Dina in Dreamgirls and she just missed the mark with me, unfortunately. I don't think it helped that she didn't have the strongest English accent. She's an American performer and she was charming and she was seductive, but I also wasn't getting the vocal I was expecting from her, given that she is a fantastic vocalist. I felt like she was never confident or secure enough in giving you the dance and the vocals at the same time. Admittedly, a very challenging things to do, but I never got the sateen that I was expecting from her. When I saw Tanisha Spring, who was the alternate slightly later in the run, I thought she was fantastic and she was just a star. And especially in those production numbers, when she was giving you sateen performing at the Moulin Rouge, she exudes this star quality. This brings us to Melissa James. And I was a little bit uncertain in her first number, just because the whole sparkling diamond number with Diamonds Are A Girl's Best Friend seemed to sit a little low in her voice. And when you're dancing full out at the same time, the last thing you want is to be reaching for a slightly uncomfortable vocal placement. But everything thereafter convinced me more and more. Her performance really began from the following number when she is singing Firework. That was a huge vocal and I was like, oh, okay, this is what her voice is going to do in this show. And that I thought was fantastic. Everything else after that, I was completely convinced. And it's the acting for me that really was the highlight of her performance. The way she foreshadows the illness that Satine has and then develops it. I've seen others sort of play like close to death throughout and then she just keeps being close to death and like you keep seeing flashes of it. And Melissa, it really just grows. And there's a scene where they're all arguing and she has this cough to one side and it was the slightness of it. And she's trying not to make an issue about it. She's just sort of trying to stifle this cough and doing, and unless you're watching her, you're not going to notice it for a good few seconds, but it would be so easy to play that moment broad, like, oh, I'm coughing and I'm dying in the corner over here. But it's the subtlety of the way that she plays it and her interactions with the Duke. Oh my gosh, her interactions with the Duke. So first of all, her chemistry with Christian, completely believable. You can see the affection that she has for him. It begins not as this obvious love. It begins that she's just sympathetic towards him and she's sort of taken aback by him, which is a completely believable route into their love because you have to have something that's gonna get you to believe they've fallen in love that quickly. And her being surprised at the way that he comes across is certainly a good way of doing that. But then her response to Ben Richards as the Duke, the way that she is forcing back tears when she's reprising Diamonds Are Girl's Best Friend in the act two sequence where he is transforming her um, into 
his his woman basically when he's having her have an expensive makeover on the Champs Elysees and uh, she's singing the sad reprise. That's a fantastic moment. That's one of my favorite moments of hers in the show. And the moment where she finally rebukes his affections right at the end, and then her dying moments, heartbreaking, wonderful, powerful acting scenes from Melissa James. She, she's a fantastic actress, really, really remarkable. And it adds this extra layer of emotional depth to the show because I felt before, and I had heard this from friends as well, it didn't devastate me when Satine died the first time I saw this show and I was genuinely moved this evening. And that's an important difference because you ought to really feel for this character. But in Melissa James's hands, you understand why she's making all of these choices and you root for her and you empathize with her and you are genuinely devastated to see the fate that befalls her. Matt Rickson is now playing the role of Harold Zidler. He is a very important component of the opening of the show because he is this MC, master of ceremonies. He is in charge. He is bringing you the showmanship and the command of that opening sequence. And it's a really winning and mammoth opening sequence with all of the different songs that happen in this medley. And his is the uh, the most immediate and the first really charismatic performance that you see on that stage. He's going to welcome you, the audience, into the Moulin Rouge. And he does a great job as this MC character. And his offstage Harold Zidler, his friendship with Satine is excellent. And he's so endearing and he's really, really funny. His scene with where they're rehearsing the play and he wants the razor prop and doesn't have it. And then he gets his own razor prop and he's defiant towards to lose his director. That's really, really funny. I also think in comparison with Clive Carter, the original Harold Zidler, who I thought was fantastic and wonderful on all fronts, I thought that Matt Rickson plays it a little more ostensibly queer. It feels camper. It feels more believably like a gay man. But I think that comes with the sort of softer approach that he has to the role and a sort of a gentleness because the inverse of that is that he was lacking a little bit more of the sharp edge that Harold Zidler can have, especially when pushing Satine to uh, to fulfill her obligations, shall we say. There are some wonderful moments in the script where Harold really changes and switches and we see him behave quite abruptly and quite aggressively. And I was missing a little bit of that edge. You know, he, he met those moments and his temperament changed, but I wanted to see a little bit of the underlying sharpness throughout so that it was just a little more unpredictable as to when he was going to behave that way. Because there is that closeness between him and Satine, but he is still behaving instinctively in pursuit of his own prosperity and survival. The real villain of the show, however, remains the Duke de Monroth. So Ben Richards is now playing this role. I've seen him on stage before. I saw him in the UK tour of 9 to 5, where he was once again playing a villain who tries to manipulate women he believes he has power over. And he's a great fit for this part, actually. When I found out he was cast as the Duke de Monroth, I thought that was brilliant. He does have this villainous edge to him while still being suave. You know, you would look at him and think, yes, there is a fantastic, handsome option for Satine. He seems like this obvious leading man type, but he has this very believable insidiousness to him as well. So he's perfect for playing this kind of a villain, a villain who is dashing enough that Satine ought to be able to choose him so easily, but it's because she loves Christian, it's because the Duke treats her badly that um, she chooses otherwise, because we don't want to feel as an audience like she's choosing the young, handsome Christian over the like older, less appealing Duke. The Duke has to, and I can't believe I'm going to say this, but he has to look dilfy enough to seem like a viable option for Satine. There you go, I've said it. And Ben Richards, he ticks that box, shall we say. He's also a fantastic singer. I do feel like his characterization is not quite at the same level when he sings as when he is speaking, because he's giving you that pretentious Duke 
characterization speaking voice and then when he sings he goes a little bit mid-atlantic and a few of them do and i think it's because we're singing contemporary pop songs that everyone feels inclined to go a little bit mid-atlantic rock and roll but i happen to think that you can sing all of the duke of monroth's material while maintaining something closer to the english accent that he speaks with i think it just keeps it more characterized and villainous and you can still sing rocky but in english i don't know why everyone tends towards the american style you do not have to do that I would also like to shout out to Nathaniel Morrison, who has joined the production, and I saw him playing the role of Toulouse Lautrec this evening. He is understudying the role, um, so sadly I didn't get to see Ian Carlyle, but Nathaniel was fantastic. He was funny, and the faces he was making to the audience, he has so much wit to his performance, and still all of the pathos and the sincerity. It's a beautiful role within the show, and I thought he performed it fantastically. It was, it was a lovely, still very much a scene-stealing characterization. So I do think with this replacement cast, that the roles that need to be knocked out of the park are are now getting knocked out of the park. I think we believe that central romance and we can root for those protagonists and they are delivering the vocal fireworks that we need them to. That isn't to say I loved every single performance in the show because I did feel like I missed Zoe Burkett and the other original four Lady Marmalades who kick off the show and who then return a few times throughout. Zoe is a brilliant dynamic performer who was also covering Satine while she was in the show, and I cannot tell you what I would have given to have had the chance to see her play the role. I'm sure she would have been incredible as Satine. I'm sure she was when she got to go on. But what the new Lady Marmalades lack is that same kind of a leader with that kind of a presence and a charisma, because your eye always went to her when she was in the show in that lineup and now the four don't feel quite as strong and where you really feel that is in the speaking scenes i do enjoy amy thornton as nini because her dancing is spectacular the way that she dances you cannot not be mesmerized by her dance performance and i enjoyed the characterization of her acting as well the only thing that jarred with me and this was with a few of them is the accent choice and something about Moulin Rouge being this period musical that's set in France for some reason it's a very contemporary English accent that makes it sound a little bit like Hollyoaks like when we're having dialogue that's delivered like you need to be more careful Satine and I'm like just something about your accent and the way that it's hitting you can modify your voice slightly you don't have to sound posh you don't have to go cockney but there's a way of just transposing your accent a little bit to make it sound more period appropriate. I'm also sad to say I did have a little bit of an issue with Tiago Don Bamberger's performance as Baby Doll. Again, not with the numbers or the singing or the dancing, both fantastic and you could pick out his vocal and he was doing a great job there and in the production numbers. It was just with the few moments of dialogue that Baby Doll has. And I was reminded this evening that I don't love this character because it feels like performative transness because we are casting consistently cis males to play this character whose gender identity is never really explored but there is a joke at their expense which doesn't feel fantastic it feels like a box they're trying to tick aesthetically without any of the meaning behind it either in the casting or in the script so i don't love that characterization and um i didn't love the portrayal either it's another one that was kind of giving me hollyoaks line reading when I wanted it to be a little bit more period. So I still think that the best moment in the show is the opening of Act Two. Backstage Romance is such a phenomenal number. It really is fantastic the way that it builds. It just has you stamping your feet wherever you are in the theatre. It is so pulse raising. The choreography is mind-blowingly good and the tension and the drama and the costuming and the lighting and the way the stage f collapses and then rises again and the way that the music has been arranged it all comes together to create this perfect thumping thunderous act two 
opening number. And it's exactly what an act two opening number ought to be. It brings back the audience and it just ignites everything with that energy that we had lost over the interval. And it gets you straight back into the show with your blood circulating. I still have similar reservations about some of the creative choices that I had before. I don't like the way the Elephant Love medley becomes this elaborate thing where they're on the Eiffel Tower and they're not really singing to each other when they're singing these romantic things. I think fine to have all of that going on around them and fireworks and people twirling and oh my gosh, we're falling in love and that's what it feels like. But I just wish they were focused more on each other when they were singing. All of that's happening around them, but they can't perceive any of it because all they can see is each other as they're staring into each other's eyes. That's what that number ought to be, but instead they're doing costume changes and holding umbrellas and it's just a bit much. And that's where it starts to feel like style over substance, which happens a couple of times in the show. There's the occasional moment where I think we have just one song too many. I think, like I said in my last video, that Moulin Rouge does not have the best musical theatre score, but it may have the most score. There are so many songs, and some of them feel like they were added in for a laugh, and that's not the vibe I get when I'm watching the Baz Luhrmann movie. I feel like the songs, though it's perhaps a little bit silly the way that they've been used, are all done with sincerity. But I do think we've gained so much here by having this believable pairing at the centre of the show. This was always my biggest complaint, my biggest reservation about the show previously, that you were getting a spectacle that had not enough heart. And now I think we have more heart. Yes, it's still campy. It's not completely sincere, but certainly more so than it was. So at this point, I'm prepared to recommend this to anyone who loves the film, anyone who's looking for a meaningful love story, but it's those people really who are looking for a lavish, spectacular West End show. If you book great seats for this, you will have a captivating experience. That same kind of thing that you get from being on a cabaret table at Cabaret, it does not have the same level of intensity and sort of powerful acting performance and meaning and substance, but what it has is spectacle and grandeur. It looks stunning, you can get dressed up and you can have yourself a lovely evening feeling very fancy at the theatre by going to Moulin Rouge. And this is probably the place you are most likely to get that kind of an experience right now in London. Thank you so much for watching today's video. I hope you enjoyed my thoughts on the new cast of Moulin Rouge. If you have already seen any of these new cast members in these roles, let us know what you thought in the comments section down below. Also, if you've had a chance to see any of the new understudies, I would love to hear about them as well. I'm hopefully going to be going to Moulin Rouge again soon while this new cast are still in the show, and I would love to try and see some of the new principal understudies. So let me know if you enjoyed anyone understudying those roles as well. Thank you so much for watching. If you enjoyed, make sure to subscribe to my YouTube channel for plenty more content coming very soon, including more review videos. I've also promised that I was going to make a video about my experience of being in the Can Can seats at Moulin Rouge. So that is still on its way. Do not worry. I still want to talk about that experience and let you know whether I think that what you would pay for those tickets is actually worth it. So again, make sure you subscribe so you don't miss that content. And don't forget you can click on the links down below to become a member on my YouTube page to get a bunch of exclusive content and early previews of new videos. And also sign up for a free account with ShowScore so you can start reviewing shows for yourself. I hope that everyone is staying safe and that you have a stagey day. For 10 more seconds, I'm Mickey Joe Theatre. Oh my god, hey. Thanks for watching. Have a stagey day. Subscribe!